Okay, so today I'll present this paper, Taming Transformers for Higher Resolution Image Synthesis. And th this is also the VQ GAN paper, in case you're more familiar with that terminology. And it's a pretty involved paper, so maybe I'll overshoot the time limit, but hopefully um, you'll stay with me. So the TLDR version is that they propose one architecture which leverages the strengths of both CNNs and transformers to do a variety of image synthesis tasks quite well. So for example, they, the same architecture can go from depth to RGB, semantic map to RGB, poles to RGB, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they also show a significant improvement in generating high resolution images using transformers, which is something which has not been done before. So you can see here that the input is, the task is image completion and their method significantly performs better than the previous method of image GPT. Similarly here, there are more images. So task complete, image completion is still the task and they do much, much better compared to the previous one. And now before I talk about how they achieve, accomplish this performance, I want to just compare transformers and CNNs to give you a better idea. So some disadvantages of CNNs are they make too strong inductive, they have too strong inductive biases. So for example, they have these inductive biases as we know of spatial invariance and locality. Um, which basically upper bound the expressivity of the model um, and limit performance. In some sense, there's upper bound to the performance, which is the model cannot go do better than these assumptions. However, these assumptions mostly we know are kind of hold in most cases. So this makes learning efficient because the model can already, already has its prior knowledge encoded in its structure. And we know local interactions, which is what CNNs encourage matter more in low-level processing, which also adds to the efficiency. On the other hand, transformers have no inductive biases, so their expressivity has no limit in some sense. However, they're more computationally expensive to train because they don't have inductive biases. More particularly, their co cost will increase quadratically because they consider all pairwise relations. They compute attention scores between all pairs of elements in the input sequence. Their cost increases quadratically with sequence length, which is bad, especially if you want to generate higher resolution images. So their method kind of, we'll see, kind of gets best of the both, best of both worlds. So I want I first describe how they train their model, and then we'll talk about testing to make life easier. But they train in two phases, and the goal of the first phase is that they want to learn a discrete representation of an image from which they can decode and get an image, basically. So let's let's see how they do this. So given an image, they first just run a random, a simple CNN encoder to go into to get a latent space representation. And for each vector in this latent space, so I'm talking about there are h cross w vectors total, each of dimension n sub z. So for each vector. They main, they kind of have this also a code book, which they com which they compare each vector with, and they replace each vector by the closest vector in the code book. This code book, by the way, is learned. Think of it as like set of embeddings. So, you, for for example, in this vector, they, in this example, it happens. It just so happens that this vector will be closest to probably the first vector in the code book. So you replace this by the first vector that position. And similarly, the second position is happens to be the close to 42nd position. So 42nd vector goes here, et cetera, et cetera. And the decoder gets this discrete representation, discrete because there are only n minus one vectors here. So it's discrete. And discrete representation from which it has to get the approach. And they basically train this entire thing in a GAN-like style. So there is a discriminator and you have that min-max loss. The discriminator note is just like a patch wise discriminator. So instead of saying if the image is fake or real, it says if the if a particular patch is fake or real it, for all patches, and you can get overall score by just averaging the, each score in the patch, each score in this output image in some sense. And in addition to this discriminator loss, they also have these other loss terms, which basically force the output of the encoder to be the same as the entry in the code book. So in the, it will force, for example, this first vector to be close to the first vector here in the code book. And 
they do this basically SG here is the stop gradients operation. So no gradients go in the encoder, for example, in the, from the first term, first term and the for, in the first term just forces the output of the code book to be, to be the same as the output of the encoder. And the second term does the other way. So it forces the encoder to be close to the output of the code book. And if there is SG, so basically this is treated as constant. Now in ZQ is treated as constant in the first term, e, the output of the encoder is treated as constant. In the, in, sorry, ZQ is treated as constant in the second term and the output of the encoder is con, treated as a constant in the first term. Note this is more general than just having a L2 loss over both over between this the difference of these two terms without having any stop gradient operation because of this beta factor. So this kind of says I can learn the update encoder and learn the code book at different rates. Okay, so basically just the big the high level idea here is that this approach learns after you perform this training method, you will have a learned code book. And what is a code book like? What does it intuitively in English mean? Basically, you can think of each vector as some sort of patch type, because the, the for example, the first vector will be the vector that will be replayed that will come here, and this this vector has a receptive field in the input that it is that its value is computed off of. So, in some sense, the first vector is the patch wise embedding of that patch. It's the embedding of that patch, right? And so it's like, then this, this holds true for all, element, all vectors in the code book. Okay. So in, 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 the fa in phase two of their method, in, in, of their training, they basically have a transformer and they forget about the decoder and the discriminator in this part. They want to now train a transformer that can auto regressively generate a sequence of ind indices of the code book, which, so if the, for example, the transformer generates one, 42, and three, you know that one corresponds to this vector, 42 corresponds to some vector, and three corresponds to some vector. You can construct a, such a representation, the Z sub Q representation, and then pass that to the decoder to get sample an image, right? So the way this train, the training happens is basically you take an image, you encode it. So since phase one is over, so the weights of encoder are pre-frozen. So you, you take an image, encode it, get this and quantize the encoding. So you get this Z sub Q vector and you ask the transformer to predict this in sequence. So to make this a sequence, just flatten it. So you have 1, 40, 2, 3, 3, and then you go 94 goes down, you just flatten it. So 1, 40, 2, 3, 3, and 94 is the next part, right? So you ask the transformer basically to maximize the likelihood that it will predict this sequence for this image. This is basically just like a language, how you, how you train a language model. So at testing time, what you basically can do now, since you have a trained transformer and trained code book and trained decoder and encoder, well, you don't need the encoder in testing time because you don't get any input. What you basically do is you sample from the transformer. So you generate a sequence from the transformer autoregressively, convert that sequence into, some, into a Z sub Q type the style. So in, you basically have an edge cross W plus n sub z. So the transformer will take, will generate indexes. So it will generate one, 42, three, for example. And you, you, when you convert it to this latent space, you will convert, you will put, instead of one, you will put the first vector and 42, you'll put the 42nd vector, right? And you will pass that to the decoder. The decoder hopefully will generate a nice image. Now, note that this will, you will never kind of do exactly this because you want generation to be conditioned on something. You don't want to just randomly generate or at least in the experiments they, the, in this paper and so i'll talk about how you can condition things how can you how can you condition generation so for example how can you condition the generation uh, how can you condition it on a semantic map how given a semantic map how do you generate the image corresponding to that semantic map not just any image right okay so that's the next, next one so basically you change the training objective of the transformer from max p of s s is the sequence here uh, um, and from S given C, where C is something that you condition on. And in, so most likely C has some spatial structure because C is an image, segmentation map, think segmentation map, depth map, et cetera. So if C is image, then you train another VQ GAN with a new code book. 
So for example, you do repeat this procedure of phase one, where this, instead of using the original image, you use the semantic map or whatever that image, the image that you use to condition on. So depth map, semantic map, whatever. And you learn a new code book. And for every image, then you can get me the sequence of indices, right? By following this procedure. So you get, you encode it, you quantize it. And you can, when you quantize it, you can just get me the index of everything. You can get, you can get a sequence like this, right? Um, and that sequence will be prepended to the transformer. So this is basically the same as the like conditional language generation, right? Like you, you write some paragraph and you ask a generative model to con complete the paragraph. You, so that's the same idea. Okay, so this is one variant of the original model to this to help in conditional generation. And second, this is high resolution image generation. So how do you generate high resolution images? Well, you cannot use this method that we talked about because if the image is of high resolution, that means H, capital H and capital W are too high, which correspondingly mean small H and small W are too high. And which will mean that the sequence length is too, much, too, too large because the sequence length is just H times W. So, and if you have very long sequences in transformers, then the cost is quadratic, right? As we talked about, so you cannot do that practically. So what you basically do is you, instead of using the entire image to generate one pixel, you just use a patch. So you generate like in a patch wise manner, you generate like, for example, when you want to ge generate this pixel, you just look at the neighborhood patch. You don't look at the entire image or entire set of pixels that have been generated before. So this patch um, dimensions are controlled and therefore the sequence length is controlled. Okay, so that this is what basically the slide is saying. Okay, so that's the method. Um, and I realize this like kind of, kind of, it's a complicated thing. So feel free to ask questions on Slack or happy to set up any personal meetings with people and to explain. And so the way they test their method, they, got, they carry out many experiments. So the first experiment is, for, to judge the importance of transformers. So they keep the entire architecture the same. I realize that I'm kind of over time. So I'll keep this part fast. So they they keep, they basically have the same architecture, replace the transformer with some other method, state-of-the-art method, which is pixel snail. It is based on convolutions and self-attention, but not does not use transformers. And they train their transformer for the same amount of time steps and same amount of time as they train the pixel snail method. And they say that their method achieves, the transformer achieves a much lower loss or well, lower loss at least than the pixel snail method, meaning that the transformer actually um, is adding value. The second experiment is just a qualitative assessment. So you can see these are like some images that their model has generated and they look like kind of pretty good. And this is not using the high image, high resolution image generation, like the patch wise type idea that I talked about. This is just like the vanilla version of the algorithm. And this is, however, the patch wise one. So you can see the high, the amount of detail that this has. Um, these are all images generated by conditioning on the semantic map of these things, of these pictures. So it's like pretty wonderful and exciting. Okay, so the final experiment they do is to see how much, um, how, how does the context that, how much, how does performance vary with the amount of context that they encode in their context, in their latent space? And context here is just the, um, the ratio of the original height to the height of the um, latent space. And larger F, when F is constant, uh, is context, um, basically means that each embedding each patch wise embedding the which was in the code book so remember each and each vector in the code book is kind of um if i go back to that slide each each vector in the code book is uh, embedding for each uh, for a patch type so if you have so if if you're if the ratio is small that means that the the receptive field of that, for example, the first element or any element here is small, and the patch is small, which means you will not get 
you you will not be able to encode global uh, global information in that batch and that is what they see if, if the batch size is basically small if the context is small if, if it's too small just like two if the height just reduces by a factor of two then they only they they cannot basically generate anything they can only generate like these small structures of eyes or whatever and you can see a tip of the nose or the part of the lips here is visible because the global information is lacking if the patch size is increased more so the results improve but you can still see there are details that are they don't look like particularly nice for example this side of this man is bearded but this is not because again the patch size is too small to capture everything but if you if they keep increasing this further like to 16 um then they get nice images but this is like a detail so it's fine if you maybe we did not get everything on the slide um all right so that's all i have so in summary they have this nice idea of using cnn's first transformers and you they use discrete representations which um significantly increases performance and adversarial training to learn patchwise embeddings and their contrib main contributions are basically they show that transformers can be used to generate arbitrarily high resolution images using that batch-wise generation idea that we talked about. And they present a general method for any conditional image synthesis task. Sorry, there's a typo here. And they show significant improvement from prior results. And these are the references.